We start with uh, one of a series of lectures that I'll give on reading objectives. And we'll talk today, you know, I, was, I usually say this is breeding for disease and insect resistance. But over the last few years, from working with the uh, students in Africa, I realized that one of our biggest pest problems there is uh, Striga, which is a parasitic weed. And, and so I probably should have said breeding for disease, insect, and parasitic weed resistance. But to sort of pull this in line with the next lecture I'll give, which won't come for about a two and a half weeks, I'll be talking about breeding for tolerance to abiotic stresses. So I thought I would talk today, or talk today about biotic stresses, which are in essence stresses caused by living organisms. Diseases, we can have fungi, bacteria, viruses, insects can cause stresses, nematodes, and parasitic weeds. And later, we'll talk about abiotic stresses caused by environmental factors primarily. Things such as water stress, temperature stress, and nutrient stress primarily. And of course, if we're talking about biotic stresses, there are lots of ways that we control any of these stresses. Cultural measures is very, very important, so I don't want to downplay the importance of things like intercropping or removing degree, de debris to get inoculum levels lower or uh, various types of, of in, in fact, good crop management, good fertility that gives the plants better nutrient base and, and more vigorous growth. All of that can control biotic stresses. Chemical control not used very much in the large acreage crops because of the expenses involved, uh, but used in a, a lot of fruit and vegetable crops and has been used very extensively in crops like cotton. And of course, the chemical control has environmental effects. Uh, the chemicals affect not only the target organisms, but non-target organisms. The chemicals build up in the environment, and a lot of these chemicals are toxic to humans and animals as well as to the diseases and insects. So there are human health effects associated with it. And of course, the, the chemicals are expensive. So resistant varieties is one form of controlling biotic stresses, and it's, it's a, a, you know, almost the ideal form if you can develop resistance because you don't have to use any chemicals. Uh, but if you need to, you can use chemicals with a resistant variety and use less of the chemical and, and get a better effect. Uh, you can use resistant varieties in any of your cultural practices and methods. So it's a very versatile type of uh, control method to use. And uh, I actually uh, used to teach a course on breeding for disease and insect resistance. And Dr. Griffiths has taken over that course. So I won't try to give you all of the content of that course in today's lecture. But if we're going to talk about resistance to biotic stresses, important things that we have to realize are that we're dealing with interactions between living organisms. And so we'll talk about the implications there. We'll talk about some of the mechanisms of resistance, the specificity of the resistance, but also specificity of the pest ability to attack plants. And we'll talk about some two classical types of resistance, vertical and horizontal. That leads us into the inheritance, and then we'll talk about the steps you need to go through in breeding for resistance. And identifying sources of resistance is very, very important. And today, and becoming more and more important, is developing resistance using uh, transformation or transgenic methods. So the first concept, <coughs> I worked for years in breeding for disease and insect resistance in maize. And, and so I was very masterful at documenting all of the damage that all of the insects and diseases did to maize and how, you know, my entire world consisted of developing varieties resistant to all of these pests. But, you know, actually I knew then, as I know now, most plant species are resistant to most insects and diseases. I mean, if not, the plants wouldn't grow. 
Now, why are they resistant? Probably because in order to develop a disease on a living organism such as a plant, the pathogen or the pest would have to evolve with that plant over time. And we have some cases of pest expanding their host range, and that certainly occurs. But there's got to be some sort of genetic and physiological interrelationship between the host plant and whatever past pest or pathogen you're dealing with. And of course, uh, plant stresses can also be caused by these abiotic factors. And a lot of people tend to lump uh, effects of ozone or pollution, effects of nutrient deficiencies, or various other environmental effects with sort of uh, diseases. When in point of fact, if it's a true disease or biotic stress, it's caused by a living organism. Uh, and more importantly, the stresses involve interaction of two organisms, and resistance, therefore, can be active or passive. So anytime you're dealing with disease or insect pressure, you're dealing with this interaction, and it's sort of called a disease triangle or an insect triangle, or whatever you like to have. But the pathogen, its genetics, the amount of inoculum, its ability to survive on non-host crops to persist in off season all of these factors of the pathogen come into play. The host characteristics certainly play a big, big role. Uh, and you can do all sorts of things to help protect the host plant or to help relieve and make the host plant healthier. You can add genetic resistance. The nutritional status of the plant affects its interaction with the pathogens and such things as planting date. If, if you can, some cases you can plant early and harvest early and avoid buildup of the diseases. Other cases, uh, you wait until a disease epidemic subsides and do an alternate planting. But when you're dealing with pathogens interacting with hosts, the environment is a major factor, probably the most important factor. Um, I'll give an example. In 1970, we had a very devastating disease on maize in the US, southern corn leaf blight epidemic. Hit in 1970, it reduced maize yields in the U.S. by 30 percent. And, and that's a significant effect. That's like, what did someone calculate? If all of that maize was fed to cows, that's like four billion hamburgers. So significant reduction. Well, in 1971, there was almost no southern corn leaf blight in the U.S. And of course, those of us who were plant breeders at the time took immense credit for that by telling the general public, yes, we just worked like the Dickens and we motivated and moved all of these resistant materials into place and we really solved the problem in one year. When actually the difference was in 1970, the year started out as hot, humid, very early spring and summer in the southeastern part of the U.S., excellent conditions to build up inoculum of the fungus that caused the disease. And then that heat and humidity sort of swept up through the corn belt and the disease sort of flourished with it. 1971, we had a much colder spring, a much drier spring, and there was just as much inoculum, almost as much susceptible <coughs> plant genetics out there, but almost no disease development. So the environment plays a major role in this interaction of living organisms. All right, we talk about specificity of resistance. And again, you know, if, if you're the plant breeder, you talk about the specificity of the resistance in your plant. If you're a plant pathologist or an entomologist, you talk about the specificity of your pathogen or your insect for causing damage or disease. But there's sort of what we call non-host resistance. The reason why most plants are resistant to most insects and diseases is either those insects or diseases don't recognize that host plant as a potential source of, of food and, and nourishment, or those plants have mechanisms that sort of make them generally resistant to just about any pest that would want to come along and attack. We're going to talk primarily about the pathogen or pest specific resistance. Most of that is activated 
and often resistant mechanisms are activated after the attack. And just why would you think that most resistant mechanisms are activated after a plant's attacked by a pathogen? Exactly. If, if you're going to develop a lot of secondary metabolites to resist a specific pathogen and you're using all of the energy to develop those metabolites, you're taking that energy away from developing other materials like yield. And so those plants that tend to be resistant to a lot of different organisms in general often are resistant to yield. And that's one of the, the sort of Murphy's Laws of Plant Breeding whenever you find that variety that really has all of the resistance that you're looking for, you put it in the first yield test, you find out, yes, yeah, resistant to everything, including yield. It won't yield either. And, and so you then have the often long and, and uh, difficult process of trying to get enough of the resistant factors into a higher yielding background without lowering the yielding potential of your final variety. <coughs> So within these uh, uh, specific resistances, <clears throat> we can also have a different level of specificity. <clears throat> we can have some varieties that in general are resistant to all of the populations of a particular disease or particular insect. And so we call this a horizontal resistance. It's often controlled by polygenes. And there is no cultivar by pathogen isolate interaction. On the other hand, we can have very, very specific resistances. And we'll talk about these. I'll, I'll expand on this in just a few minutes. But vertical resistance, it's often controlled by single genes. Major effects of those genes, single dominant genes, and often involves what we call a hypersensitive reaction. But before I go on, our friends in entomology also have developed their own sets of definitions. And really the major difference is most pathogens are sort of wind blown or water blown or bird transmitted or insect transmitted. So that most pathogens end up landing on a plant surface and either they can cause disease or not. Whereas insects can get up and move around. They can crawl, they can walk, they can hop, they can fly. So when we start talking about resistance to insects, we also have a category of resistance that we call non-preference. So that plants can develop chemicals that smell bad for insects. Or they can develop a, a texture that feels bad for insects. And, and so the non-preference mechanism comes in particularly with insect resistance. Otherwise, antibiosis for insect resistance is almost like an induced, not hypersensitivity, but an induced form of resistance in the plant. The plant actually produces materials that either kill the insect or slow its developmental rate or slow its egg laying capabilities. And in both cases, we have tolerance. The entomologists are, are uh, really consider tolerance a lot more actively than, than our friends in plant pathology. But basically tolerance is a plant's ability to support a fairly high pest population and not have its yield reduced. So you really don't have any stress or any selection factors in the insect population to make it want to develop better because the insect develops fine. It's just for whatever reason, the insect chews on parts of the plants that aren't vital for the plant's production of yield. <clears throat> but the other side of this coin, <clears throat> and one we often, uh, if not ignore, we don't, we don't spend a lot of time talking about, is the specificity of parasitic ability. Certain of these organisms that attack plants are generalist. You know, the European corn borer is a good example. The European corn borer feeds on about 100 different plant species. I mean, European corn borers feed on a lot of the weeds that occur in and around a cornfield. And yet, when the Bt gene was introduced 
to develop resistance to the European corn borer, a major concern was, well, wait a minute, the corn borer is going to evolve a mechanism to overcome the Bt gene. Well, maybe. I don't think it'll happen while I'm still alive, because why would the corn borer as a species evolve a mechanism to overcome a Bt gene in corn? I mean, when it can happily feed on 99 other plant species and any corn that doesn't have the Bt gene, you know, it's just as likely for the European corn borer to decide to evolve to attack wheat, which it doesn't attack. I mean, why would you think that a generalist insect, <clears throat> the, the insects and the pathogens that have problems with single dominant genes for resistance are these guys down here, the specialists. Insects like a hessian fly. A hessian fly can survive on wheat and a couple of closely related species and nothing else. So if you do something to wheat, to make it unattractive for the hessian fly, the hessian fly as a species says, all right, either we got to overcome this resistant factor in wheat or we're going to be extinct. A lot of selection pressure for these specialist insects and diseases. And so uh, we'll talk in a few minutes about a gene for gene concept of resistance and pathogenicity. And really, the gene for gene concepts were developed for diseases like late blight in potato and for insects like hessian flies, where, uh, boy, you put a major factor in their host that makes that host unsuitable, and there is tremendous selective pressure on that pest population to evolve. Once you get mutations within that population that can overcome that factor, those mutant individuals multiply very, very rapidly and soon dominate the populations. Whereas these generalists, I mean, why worry about it? Well, but, you know, but with the Bt corn, I mean, it made sense. I mean, we plant trap crops and we plant non-Bt corn around it and, yeah, and most farmers don't plant as much of the non-Bt borders and such as they should. And particularly when we get to Bt cotton and we get to Bt cotton in developing countries, they're, you know, they're not going to follow those recommendations, but the Bt gene in cotton controls the cotton budworm, which is the corn earworm, which attacks about 100 or more different species. And from, from my view, the chance of these generalist insects or pathogens, I mean, there's just no selective advantage. I mean, if you put a gene for hessian fly resistance in a wheat population, those individual hessian flies that develop resistance predominate and soon take over the population. If a corn borer would develop a gene that could metabolize Bt, so what? You've got a gene that can metabolize Bt, but there's hundreds of thousands of corn borers living quite happily on weeds and crops that don't have Bt, so you're not going to predominate and, and become a significant part of the population. Well, in certain parts of the country, <coughs> seems to be nine out of ten plants. So wouldn't there be regional selection pressures in western Iowa? Uh, it's getting more so. I mean, used to be Iowa, we had about half corn and half soybeans. And, and we rotated fields back and forth. But now with this big push for biofuels and ethanol, we're getting more and more. Yeah, if 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 you did very com complete weed control. But I mean, this thing feeds on Johnson grass. It feeds on panicums. It, it feeds on almost any type of grass species. Um, it feeds on a lot of dicot crops as well. Uh, so yeah, uh, if, if you really had a pure monoculture of maize and there were no weeds and no alternate crops, uh, then you worry about development of resistance. Well, resistance, you know, resistance to BT gene in European cornbread populations may already have developed, but we haven't found it yet because it has really no selective advantage in the corn borer populations, so that those individuals that might have developed resistance 
don't outperform all of the ones who haven't developed resistance and become the dominant form, you know. And in fact, so far, the only insect that, that uh, has shown the ability to overcome a BT gene is the diamondback moth in uh, cabbage. And again, that's a little, that's a different type of insect. That's more of a specialist. All right, so here's just some examples. Uh, Sclerotinia attacks soybeans and sunflowers and other crops equally as well. The green peach aphid shows up on all sorts of fruits, on uh, uh, soybeans, on lots of different crops. Specialists, this is the uh, potato blight, potato late blight, Phytophthora, and probably historically was the most important disease ever because this is what caused the Irish potato famine and resulted in starvation for a large part of the Irish population and resulted in even more uh, migration of the Irish population to places like the US. All right, so talk about the types. Vertical resistance, it's either monogenic or may be controlled by one or two codominant genes. It usually gives a hypersensitive response, which means basically an insect or a pathogen lands on a plant, starts to attack the plant, and the plant metabolizes resistance factors that sort of isolate that pathogen or insect in a little dead necrotic zone, and so you get little dead flecks on the leaves rather than seeing the entire leaf die as the uh, disease spreads. And, and so you get uh, hypersensitivity. It's race specific. <clears throat> and so to show you what that means, if you had different pathogen races and you were dealing with vertical resistance, then you would get total resistance to some of those races and no resistance to others. Whereas horizontal resistance is polygenically inherited, it just reduces the level of, of disease and usually reduces the spread of the disease, the developmental time. It's called field resistant and it's race time specific. So if you had horizontal resistance, you wouldn't be absolutely resistant to any of the pathogen races, but you would have a moderate level of resistance to all of the pathogen races. So which would you prefer if, if you're a farmer in the developing world, which form of resistance would you prefer? Both, good answer. <laughs> exactly. And uh, we, we have a lot of, of rhetoric about let's get rid of these single dominant resistance genes because they always break down. Well, they don't. We'll talk about those in a minute. And so normally, this is just a, sort of a generalized picture of how a lot of disease mechanisms work. There's a process of recognition. The host plant recognizes that there's something alien trying to feed on it or destroy it. And you develop this hypersensitive resistance. And often, that hypersensitive resistance, once it's activated, can sort of spread through the plant systemically. And so you can do some neat things like if you wanted, if, if you had a uh, pathogen that was very, very deadly and was about to move into your crop, you could take a similar form of the pathogen and put it on the crop and have the crop identify and produce that hypersensitive response and you could get that acquired resistance for the virulent strain in the pathogen. So we talked about this, the genetics, vertical, one to a few genes. These genes are mostly dominant, and they give complete protection against certain races, and they're very easy to breed. Single dominant genes, you inoculate with a disease or insect, and you can tell resistance susceptible, clear-cut differentiation. You can back cross, and in five or six back cross generations, you can transfer these genes from any source that will cross into your plant very, very rapidly. Horizontal, 
quantitative, gives partial protection against many, in fact, often against all races of a pathogen. Very, very difficult to breed. So if you're a plant breeder working in a developing country, <clears throat> which type of resistance would you rather have? Vertical. I mean, it gets even more complex than that. We'll talk in a, in a few minutes. Um, it's also interesting, these resistance genes in the host are almost always dominant. There are a few cases of recessive resistance genes, but not many. It's the avirulent genes in the pathogen that are almost always dominant. And so you have this relationship where if this is avirulent, and you've got resistance, no disease. If, even if the pathogen is avirulent, if you don't have the resistance gene, it can cause disease. Well, actually it can cause disease because there are other genes that can get by with this. And what this avirulence factor does is it produces a, a uh, elicitor. And if you don't have this elicitor, then you don't trigger resistance, and you get basically a susceptible response. To show that, and boy, I hate this. If, if you have A1, A2, R1 or R2 recognize it, you get resistance. Again, as long as you have A1 and R1 recognizes the product from A1, you get resistance. Same thing if you have A2 and you have an R2 to recognize it, the only case on that first line that you would get a susceptible reaction is you have avirulent factors, but you have no resistance genes to identify them. And so the pathogen develops. And we can go through, you can follow this through. I'll have to do it to get out of this slide, it looks like. But you can sort of predict where the reactions go. And the next slide will sort of show you why. If you have the dominant avirulence factor in the pathogen, it produces an elicitor. And if there's a resistance gene in the host, it recognizes that elicitor and triggers an active resistance mechanism. If you produce the elicitor, but there's no resistance gene, the plant recognizes maybe that there's something there, but there's no receptor here to trigger that resistance response, and so disease develops. If you don't produce that elicitor, there's nothing for the plant to recognize and nothing to trigger the plant's resistant responses, so you get susceptibility. So that's why in three cases out of four, you get disease development. The pathogen must produce, must have a dominant avirulence gene to produce that elicitor to trigger that host resistance response. So what type of resistance would you use? Well, you know, we can sort of wishy-washy on this and say, well, you want to use both, combination of vertical and horizontal. But if you got any vertical resistance, you won't be able to see any horizontal resistance. So if you're out there in, in the, the wild and you're running your breeding program and you find easy single dominant genes for resistance that give you adequate control of your major disease if you don't incorporate those into your varieties that you're releasing to farmers you, you, you got to scratch your head and wonder why I mean they're there they work and they're easy to put into varieties well once you do that then you mask any horizontal resistance that might be floating around within your crop populations. And, and so a lot of people say, okay, well, let's then let's get all of these dominant resistance genes out of the way and work on horizontal. I'm thinking, why in the world would you do that? They say, well, you've just told us that if you get these dominant resistance genes, they might break down and the pathogen could overcome the dominance resistance gene and, and so then all of a sudden all of your crop is susceptible and I can give you a number of examples 
<coughs> let's see, uh, <coughs> eight, maybe ten examples of major epidemics of disease or epiphytotics of insects that developed <coughs> because single dominant resistance genes broke down. Southern corn leaf blight, by the way, is not one of them. Southern corn leaf blight resistance is controlled by mitochondrial genes and there is no dominance recessiveness of mitochondrial genes. It's just the type of mitochondria that gave the Texas type of cytoplasmic male sterility which was used in all maize hybrids because it allowed you to produce hybrid seed very cheaply was the cause. But there are examples like potato late blight and leaf rust, several of the, the stem rust, leaf rust, uh, Hessian flies. Uh, and you know, you can, you can name a handful. Maybe you can name 15 or 20 examples. So does that imply <clears throat> that in the history of humankind and crops that we've only had 15 or so cases of major dominant resistance genes that control pathogens? No. <clears throat> I mean, we deal with rust in maize, and rust in maize is controlled primarily by one or two major dominant resistance genes, never broken down. Uh, we deal with many of <clears throat> the potentially major diseases of many crops. They're controlled rather simply. In fact, if, if you're going to take up a new disease in your crop and you're going to study the genetics of inheritance of resistance to that disease, I'll lay odds in the beginning that you're probably going to find that statistically between three and five or six major loci are involved. So we need to, to get the concept out of our head that the vertical resistance is bad and the horizontal resistance is good. Vertical resistance is excellent as, long, excellent as long as it works. When it breaks down, yeah. When it breaks down, you have to scramble to develop a new form of resistance and deploy it. But that's what plant breeders do. I mean, that's your job as plant breeders. Horizontal resistance is nice, but in most cases, people select for horizontal resistance. They don't have readily identifiable major dominant vertical genes to work with. And, and, and so in most cases, we're really working with somewhere in between a single dominant gene and total polygenic inheritance. We're usually working in the range of two to five resistance factors, maybe with some modifiers. And of course, I put in again, intolerance is the ability to, for the crop to produce without any resistance factors that we can detect. So to breed for resistance, what do you have to do? <clears throat> well, first you have to have a pathogen or a pest, and you have to get a source of inoculum. And in some environments, <clears throat> you don't worry about that because every year in that environment you get high levels of disease or insects. Uh, except when you do your thesis research, every year you get high levels of natural inoculation except the critical year when you need to do your dial analysis for resistance and then it turns out to be a dry, poor year for disease development and you take another year to complete your thesis. Uh, so in general, if you're serious about developing resistant varieties, you produce a source of inoculum and you inoculate the materials that you're going to screen. You need an assay, often that's a simple rating scale and uh, depending on uh, whether you lump or split, the scale can be 1 to 3, 1 to 5, 1 to 10, whatever you want. And uh, usually the 1s are the less diseased and the 10s are the most diseased or the 5s are the most diseased. Um, you need to find a source of resistance and that's, that's often the critical factor. And uh, you need to incorporate the resistance into elite varieties and when you do that, you need to look for, for two things, yield drag and yield lag. We'll talk about those in a minute. So sources of resistance <clears throat> within your primary gene pool for your crop, you can go to resistant cultivars who are often available. It's just they don't yield very well. 
but they're there. You can often find cultivars released that have levels of resistance. You can go back to land races, or you can go to wild progenitors, the, the ancestors of your crop species. <clears throat> you can go to related species and even distantly related species, but when you get into the secondary gene pool, you have problems with making crosses. And these are the areas where often you can find the best sources of resistance. And these are areas where first tissue culture, in terms of embryo rescue technology, to allow you to rescue embryos made from a wide cross that don't normally germinate and develop, and plant transformation technologies come into play to allow you to take a gene out of any organism modify it to turn it into a plant gene, put it into your plant, and develop resistance. So if, if you were to do that and take a single gene out of a bacterium, <clears throat> modify it to make it a plant gene, put it into a plant, haven't you just found a single dominant vertical resistance gene? I mean, very, very similar. It might have come from a bacterium, and you couldn't get it there through a natural cross, but you can get it there using technology that's, I mean, it's, it's not destructive or detrimental technology. So you can very, very readily, so, so uh, if that's the case, then <clears throat> why do we continue to go to wild progenitors, related species, and distant related species, and try to incorporate resistance using sexual crosses. Is, is, there, is there something more sacred about having a sexual cross to get that resistance gene out of a normally unrelated organism into your crop versus going in and sort of excising it, modifying it, and putting it in through molecular technology? I, I don't, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see any real difference there. The technology isn't good or bad. The problems that we could face by taking these genes from distantly related species and plugging them into our crops is those are genes in an entirely new genome. And the interactions through epistasis and pleiotrophy and through other allelic interactions at different loci are strange and different. And the products that those genes produce may be toxic or may cause allergies or may inhibit development of other processes. So it's not the technology that you're concerned with, whether you make a wide cross to get it in or whether you use transformation to get it in. It's the nature of the gene. Well, if that's the case, why do we have to take genetically modified plants through seven or eight years of extensive testing to show that the genes that we've added aren't toxic or allergenic or other factors, when if we could get those genes transferred either through a normal genetic cross or even induce the resistance through mutations, we don't do any testing. A little inconsistency there. And, and it's not trivial. A few years ago, there was an outbreak of spina bifida in the Amish populations in Pennsylvania. And it was traced back to the fact that U.S. Department of Agriculture had incorporated a gene for resistance to, I think, late blight or one of the potato diseases. It produced a toxic glycoalkaloid and they transferred that into a potato variety that they released, and that toxic glycoalkaloid gave rise to spina bifida in infants. And uh, I mean, there was no genetically modified organism involved, but the gene that was transferred was toxic. I mean, well, what do you expect? You're looking for a gene that kills a pathogen insect. You think it's not going to be toxic? I mean, isn't that what you're after? A toxic gene? All right, 
so how do you incorporate resistance into an elite variety? <clears throat> In a lot of cases, you just use recurrent selection. And, and on the exam, the key to recurrent selection is very easy. You recombine and you select over and over and over and over and over. And an acceptable answer to that question was recombine and select over and over. That's recurrent selection. And Don Vians will show you how, as a graduate student, he developed resistance to uh, a blight disease and then alfalfa using recurrent selection. And he'll show you how he could determine with two different types of resistance, how he could determine whether he was dealing with relatively simply inherited with dominance or strictly additive. Back cross breeding. If you know that there's a single dominant resistance gene, you can back cross it very readily. Or transgenics. <coughs> if you do back cross or transgenics, and you're doing it on a commercial basis, then you worry about two concepts. Yield drag is really a reduction in yield due to other things that come along with that gene. And uh, you say, well, wait a minute, if I do transgenes, there's no yield drag. Oh, yeah, there is. You can isolate those genes. You can construct them. You can get beautiful constructs. You blast them into a plant, and they insert somewhere in that plant genome. And where they insert sometimes disrupts other genetic and metabolic pathways within that genome. And so you often have undesirable effects associated. If you're back crossing via sexual crosses, then you have maybe undesirable traits linked that you have to worry with. But even if you're doing transgenics, boy, when we worked with Monsanto, uh, most seed companies work with Monsanto to get BT corn. I think we went through about 1,200 different combinations of gene constructs by individual events. And out of those, about three came out as being promising. And out of that, Monsanto 810, which was called Ezra when we first started working with him, was, was the one that, that came out to work. But you also get a yield lag. If, in fact, you're using a back cross program and you've identified a single resistance gene to a disease that suddenly hits your crop, and you back cross one generation a year for eight generations, in eight generations or eight years, you can get a resistant version of that variety. But if you're dealing with a crop like maize, the new varieties that come out each year yield 1.5% better than the ones that were there last year. So in eight years, you're looking at about a 17 or 18% increase in yield performance of the newest varieties. And your back cross variety isn't going to look so great. So if you're back crossing or if you're transferring a transgenic trait into elite genetics, you have to do two things. You start with material that's a year or two away from release in your program so that you're already one or two or three years ahead of what's commercially out there. And then you try to do the back crosses using molecular markers and get the back crossing done in two or three generations and you do those generations in one year. So that by the time you get your variety with the resistance gene deployed, it has a chance to be competitive. And I just threw in a few to show you uh, does resistance work and most of these are, are transgenic. BT potatoes and non-BT potatoes. BT potato was actually the first BT release but it came on and off the market so fast that most people didn't know it. BT corn non-BT corn, and this is corn at harvest, and these plants are basically broken over and lodged because the corn borer has eaten out the inside of the stalks. These guys are standing up so you can still harvest the ears. Normal sweet corn, BT sweet corn. Corn rootworm, BT resistance, non-resistant, the roots totally chewed off. Cotton birdworm resistant cotton, lots of cotton bowls, lots of cotton fiber produce, almost nothing over here. Uh, black ring spot papaya, the difference between do you want to grow papayas or not? The papaya industry in Hawaii disappeared. 
Ring spot resistant papaya has brought it back. You can go through Thailand today and you can, you can see the deterioration of the papaya populations. And, and, and this is a case where you see papaya planted in, in, in the, what do you call it, an orchid, orchid, but whatever you call it, papaya production. But in Thailand, you can see it with the papaya trees behind the individual houses. A lot of sick looking papaya. And the Thai government is agonizing now whether or not to allow ring spot resistance as a transgenic GM crop to be grown. Virus resistant squash and references. All right, any questions? That was a brief course on disease and insect resistance in 55 minutes.